Hello, everybody. It's me. It's your boy, Mr. Oliver, talking to you about period two. Period two. Hello, everybody. Oh, I gotta... It's me. It's All your right. boy, Mr. Oliver, talking to you. Hey, I like that I was talking like that. So anyway, um, I'm here um, on a little early. I um, <clears throat> Sorry I had to move this to four. It just worked better with my schedule, as the British would say, a schedule. And I want to talk today about period two. Now, not my period two in school, but instead period two as far as in AP European history. Now, I didn't really get a, a chance um, to talk a ton about period one the other day. So if you have any questions about period one, feel free to ask them. If you have any questions about period two, feel free to ask those as well. I figured we'd chat for about an hour and a half or thereabouts. Um, right now, I do not have a ton of people in my chat. So I'll just go ahead and start. Uh, basically, uh, period two. Period two starts in 1648. Uh, they're divided up, of course, into four periods. And the idea is that you will have one long essay question from periods one or two and one long essay question from periods three and four. And um, periods one and two, basically you got a lot of religious warfare to deal with. And then in period two, you get a lot of fun stuff. Um, stuff I like very much. Come on. So as I'm kind of waiting for people to show up, hey, baby. <clears throat> this is Lord Tigglesworth. Say hi. He's done. Okay, nice talking to you, buddy. All right. Anyway, uh, Oh, I think I can turn on chat right here. Yeah, I can't. I don't need to talk about this. Pew, 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 pew. All right. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and get it started, even if I'm alone. Because that way, at least, people can watch it later. So, um, period two starts with 1648, which is the Peace of Westphalia. And as you recall, no doubt, um, Period two, dogs are barking. That's what the dog always said. What did the dog say? Bark, 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 1648, of course, it establishes that the Peace of Augsburg, which had been established in 1555, stands in Germany. In other words, allowing German princes uh, to decide the religion of their subjects. So you might have, uh, you might have a prince who's Lutheran. Well, that means all the people that live in his territory are Lutheran as well. Um, Westphalia modifies that and adds to it Calvinism as well. So that is a fun thing about uh, about the Treaty of West or Peace of Westphalia. The um, I'm just curious of like, is there anybody else here? I'm just talking to myself. Oh, Cyan, uh, Lord Tigglesworth is uh, the cat's name. That's indeed true. Uh, Lorelai, my daughter, named him Tigger, but I have modified that, and she has accepted Lord Tigglesworth. Um, who let the dogs out? That was me. That's why I left. Anyway, um, absolute monarchy starts up around this time, and that's a good place to begin, I think. Uh, absolute monarchy uh, comes from the term absolute, right? Uh, so, no, 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 bro. Okay, hold on. Pause. Pause. Bro said, uh, did the Treaty of Westphalia or Peace of Westphalia make everybody Calvinist? It's still the ruler's religion, but previously with Augsburg, it was only 
uh, are you a Lutheran or a Catholic? Now it's, are you a Lutheran, a Catholic, or a Calvinist? And you have multiple choices now. That's very exciting. Um, so that's cool. Okay, so moving back to absolute uh, monarchy. Uh, the absolute monarchists kind of start right there at the tail end of our first period, because remember the War of the Three Henrys? Henry, the, uh, Henry of Navarre, who becomes Henry the Fourth, he takes over, and he doesn't rely on his nobles very much. He seizes more power for himself. Now, that's kind of in the style of the new monarchs. But in addition, you have... Um, you have even less reliance on asking the parliament, although in France they don't call it uh, the parliament, it's parliament spelled a little differently. Uh, they, they say, hey, we're not going to ask them for money. Instead, I'm just going to rule without them. And previously, uh, the uh, equivalent in France of the parliament was the estates general. And the estates general has people coming from the first estate, the second estate and the third estate. First estate being the clergy, the church, the Catholic church, because this is the official religion of France. Then you've got the second estate, which is the nobility. And that's, uh, of course, that's going to be uh, anybody who has a title bestowed upon them by the king. And finally, it's everybody else, which, of course, is obviously very upsetting to if you are in group three, uh, you might be like, well, how come I'm not distinguished at all? I mean, you got people all the way from the poorest of the poor to rich guys who I got my pen. Uh, uh, rich guys who don't even have a title, but like maybe your doctors, lawyers, etc., who are well read and whatnot. So Henry the Fourth doesn't consult them at all, and he's supposed to when it comes to tax increases and stuff. And by ruling without them, he kind of starts a bad precedent. I'm not trying to say that Henry the Fourth. Uh, Henry of Navarre was an absolutist, but he establishes the foundations of it because our absolutist monarchs that come after him, Louis the Thirteenth, Louis the Fourteenth, Louis the Fifteenth, and Louis the Sixteenth. Those aren't super hard to remember, um, but uh, they uh, they come along and they're like, "Oh, cool! We can rule without asking um, the Estates General for anything." Possum. And they're all like, okay, let's uh, let's try to get things done. And Louis the Thirteenth is aided by a very capable uh, first minister, and that is uh, Colbert. No, not Colbert. Cardinal Richelieu. And uh, Cardinal Richelieu is obviously he's a cardinal in the Catholic Church, but also he considers himself to be like the first servant of the crown. And he's like, hey, guys, you know, I want to establish a, a thing here where the king is all powerful. And so his goals are basically one king, one law, one faith. One king, obviously, Louis the Thirteenth. One law. That's the king's law. Anything the king says, that's law. And one faith, the Catholic Church. Now, obviously, as a Catholic Cardinal Richelieu was a bit biased there, but there was another religion that was tolerated in France at this time, and that's the Huguenot religion, which would be the French Calvinists. And the French Calvinists had been given the right to have their own walled cities, and these were um, all over France. There's like, you know, a half dozen, or no, a couple dozen, I think, one dozen or more of um, uh, the most famous La Rochelle. And Richelieu says, this is not acceptable. We need to break down these Huguenot cities because we can't have Protestants here in France. We need to bust that up, and then we need to make them Catholic. <clears throat> so um, he, he actually leads a siege on the biggest of the cities called La Rochelle, that I just mentioned. And there he um, leads an army himself and takes them down. And the Huguenots were like, wait, what? I thought we had rights here. I, I thought the, the Edict of Nantes. And Cardinal Richelieu is like, oh, we're not following that anymore, although it's still officially law. And because, you know, he's just being a weasel. And um, after he's gone, after Louis the Thirteenth is gone, and Louis the Thirteenth himself, 
I don't want you to stress out too much about Louis the Thirteenth. Louis the Thirteenth is the guy that lets uh, Cardinal Richelieu drive for him. Cardinal Richelieu is like a mastermind. He's uh, he's you know pulling strings. He's manipulating people. He's getting everybody under Louis the Thirteenth. Louis the Thirteenth's just there. He's not an especially dynamic personality or anything. But then comes Louis the Fourteenth, the next king. And Louis the Fourteenth, legendarily, uh, was influenced by a revolt that happened when he was very young. When people broke into his bedroom and attempted to uh, basically mess with him, uh, they scared the heck out of him. And he was like, supposedly, "I understand now. I can never, I can never uh, be." you know, allow my people to rule. I can never, um, I, I, I've got to have firm control over them. And so, hold on, my daughter just texted me. Um, my daughter was going to help me keep track of people's questions today, but right now her mom still hasn't picked her up, so I'm going to send the link. <clears throat> so, anyway, so um, Louis the Fourteenth, he is a dynamic personality. That really is into the whole idea that everything should revolve around him. Very famously, he says, I am the state. In other words, like, uh, hey, Louis, what's your deal? What do you think about the country? He's like, I am the country. Everything I want is what happens. I have more power than anyone has ever had over their people ever in history. And of course, there will be people later on who go further than Louis the 14th. You've got your Hitlers, your Mussolinis to a lesser extent, Stalin. Um, those guys are totalitarians. They total control people. Absolutists are a little bit like minor league compared to that. But Louis controlled his people, especially putting a focus on controlling the nobles and neutering them essentially, making it so they have very little power of their own. Uh, whereas nobles in the past had been influential Louis makes it so, hey, you're rich, cool. You could do rich people things like go to the opera and stuff or compete for my affections. So if you have to ask for something, I can be like, oh, you know what, uh, let me see. And then you don't know if you're going to have access to me or not. Um, people did jobs that were debasing to themselves, like helping him get dressed, uh, holding his uh, chamber pot, his, you know, his toilet. Um, he made his own brother wait in the same room with him uh, uh, while he slept to kind of watch over in case he needed anything, which is kind of a power move, but also kind of a jerk move. It's a little bit of both. Sorry, I keep moving the, the camera uh, because I have a tendency to wiggle. So I'm sorry. I'm a wiggly boy. So um, Louis the Fourteenth. how does he control the nobles? Most famously, he requires them to spend at least part of their living at a palace. And the palace, of course, is the Palace of Versailles. Let me find a picture of the, um, whoop, whoop, screen share. Yeah, I'm gonna screen share a picture of Versailles just to kind of remind you, just so we'll have something common to talk about. Screen share, screen share, application window, Versailles, Versailles. So what he does is he builds this ginormous palace, and uh, it is, of course, the, um, uh, it is just famously beautiful, but also you can look at it, you know, you see how he controlled nature itself, manicuring it all according to his whims. It was uh, Louis XIII's hunting palace, or not hunting palace, hunting lodge. 
And Louis XIV is like, no, a lodge will not do. I need the finest palace in Europe. And uh, things like this here, which is the Hall of Mirrors, um, it shows the just opulence. He's just rich. He's flexing on everybody. And he's showing everybody like, hey, I am the most powerful thing in the world. Um, in his bedroom, he has like all these fancy paintings um, of himself. No, whoops. Bedroom. And... Um, Where's the, he has like his fancy pants uh, mural of himself as the Sun King, which is all over the place. You have these, this symbol of him all across the palace. What I'm looking for, when I went, I took a picture, it's in his bedroom, and it has a picture of him, and he's flying around, basically he's Apollo, in um in like you know flexing on everybody it's very wild so there's that um did he violently subdue the calvinists um did he violently subdue the calvinists um louis the 14th goes a little further than louis the 13th whereas louis the 13th had i suppose you could say violently subdued the calvinists by allowing Richelieu to uh, kind of rule over him, which, oh, I'm sorry, to go over and bust up their places. Um, he, um, if I'm not seeing it, oh, uh, well, here's this kind of thing. But that's not the one I'm thinking of. Anyway, um, Louis the Fourteenth makes it illegal, and he, illegal, and he literally uh, will pull their, um, what was I talking? I'm sorry, I just read a question and then I got distracted. Um, oh, he pulls their religious protections. Under the Edict of Nantes, he revokes it. So the Edict of Nantes is revoked in 1685. Uh, it didn't even last 100 years. And um, then Louis is like, this is, it was started in 1599. And um, then Louis is like, no more protections for Huguenots. You want to be a Huguenot? You want to be a Calvinist? Get out. And... Uh, it's effective in that he gets rid of them. Oh, hold on, doorbell, just a second. <clears throat> Hello, family. How are you I'm recording right now. Oh, you're live streaming. I am live streaming. I had to walk away because I had to open the door. Hello! That's my daughter, Lorelai. What's up? You have a good day? Mm -hmm. Good. How do I check this chat feed? Yeah. I don't know if you're online. Okay, she's power crazed already. Uh, Son, are you going to say hello to me? I know. Uh, yeah. are troublemakers, Katie Cat. Not troublemakers, they're good boys. Yeah. And, um, sorry, I got to add Brand in here to somebody who's in there. And Arthur. How's your, um, I think it's going pretty good. Anyway, we were talking What's about your channel. Sorry. Just search for Mr. Oliver. Period two. Just peer two. P e r two. So, um, he uh, the nobles have to go along with this. They have no choice. They have to go live with him. He makes it an official rule. That's funny. It's not working. What, any good questions there? Maybe it's not here. Maybe it's period. Jack, can I release the puppies? You may release the puppies. It's convenient for you to talk to you. Okay. Well, I'm live right now. So, anyway, that's my wife. Hi, wife. Hola. Yep, she only speaks German, as, as everyone knows. Uh, so I put it on your thing. This is Otter. Otter is my dog. He's a good boy. He smells very bad because he's just been outside. The reason we call him an otter is because he looks like an otter when we pull his ears back. Anyway, so there's that. So, yeah, he... Um, otter! That's a little bit late. Wait, wait, call a second. Yeah, I know. There's a delay. So basically, put away your shoes, pumpkin. Go hang on up. Um, so... 
the uh, nobles are required to spend time there. Uh, while they're at Versailles, he spies on them. He reads their mail. Uh, he gets involved with things and then blackmails them to do what he wants. Like I said before, he makes it so they have to do these in order to get access to him. They have to do these kind of demeaning things in order to get near him. And um, they have to wipe his butt. Well, wow, let's get all crude here. This is a G-rated live stream. But yes, uh, they take care of his uh, needs insofar as hygiene whilst he is on the bathroom duties. And uh, yeah, Otter, you want to go to Mama? Go, go, go. So there's that. Now, um, uh, Lorelai, don't spam. Don't spam the chat. Okay. What's Otter? Leave an eighty-second Let me see. So yeah, the nobles had to do that. Um, the chapters in the book, uh, Cyan. Um, I always forget because. That's on you. Um, it's a small amount of chocolate. It was an entire chocolate brownie. That's the whole thing. How much did you eat? One half. Is he okay? Okay, anyway. So, my family brings chaos, but I love them. Thank you. My dog is cute. Um, so, anyway. Uh, they, um, other questions, the, the chapters in the book, I don't remember. Uh, it's the ones about absolutism. Um, in it, he's going to be fine. Yeah. Is there any other food in there, Laura? No. Okay. Can you get the, the bag and put it away or put it up at least? Anyway. So, um, All right. Don't spam though. Don't 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 be a, a nasty mean moderator. Uh, other stuff. So Louis the Fourteenth is essentially uh, very controlling. Um, he is also wildly uh, narcissistic. Not only calling himself the Sun King, not only comparing himself, uh, saying the world revolves around me. You know, with the whole Sun King thing, and he's also going to war constantly. He goes to war over and over again to glorify himself and bring glory to France, they frequently lose. It's not because the French army is not good. It's because he doesn't pick his battles. He just goes to war over and over again, not really for good reasons, but just to gain a little bit of territory, which then is lost in the next war or something. It's not really um, productive. <clears throat> now, Louis the Fourteenth does make a slip up and that brings us to the War of the Spanish Succession. Uh, the War of Spanish Succession starts because Louis XIV decides that he wants to uh, put his nephew on the throne of Spain. You see, Charles II, who's a little rough looking, uh, Charles II, let me go to him real quick. But Charles II, um, he, he's. Um, Well, you don't have to do it if you don't want to, Pumpkin. Okay, um, okay. Uh, warning, because this is about to be kind of an ugly boy. Uh, I know usually you're used to um, handsome boys. Uh, I warn you about them, but... Hi, Kiba. <coughs> that is 14 people in the chat. Yes. Uh, so that's that's Charles II there. He was so inbred uh, that he had a massive uh, chin, um, and they they called it they, you know they like oh you know, you're so inbred you got this. By the end of his life, you got him here. He's infertile. He cannot produce a an heir, so that's rough for that guy. And um, he is then he leaves Spain without an heir. So Louis, being a good guy, good guy Louis says. What about my nephew? And everybody's like, wait, Louis, you constantly go to war. You're crazy about yourself. And now 
You want to put your nephew, your family member on the throne of the next closest country to your West, Spain, and replace the Spanish Habsburgs. Remember, uh, Charles V, when he divided up his land, had given this. Is, this guy's related to Charles V over in the Holy Roman Empire. Um, remember, that guy is related. He is um, he's a Habsburg technically. And Louis's like, yeah, you know, we'll get rid of that guy. Lorelai, don't spam people. No, um, it is important. Your important. All my content is important. He does look a little bit like Jimmy Neutron. So I guess what you're saying is that Jimmy Neutron is inbred. <laughs> my daughter liked that joke. Yeah, I can what see did it. You type in the chat? Yeah, I can see that. Well, anyway, don't look like Jimmy Neutron, I guess, kids. That's that's what we really want to take away from this. Um, so, um, uh, the, anyway, Louis suggests this. Everybody goes to war with him. It's a grand alliance of every major power. Uh, of course, the most important being England, but you get Prussia as well, Austria as well. They all go to war against him. They easily defeat him. But at the end, you have this awkwardness. Where it's like, well, okay, if we don't take Louis, uh, if you don't take Louis, um, sorry, they're talking about Jimmy Neutron in the, in the chat. If you don't take Louis' nephew as being the new king of Spain, then who's going to take over? So they come up with this wacky compromise. Remember, they went to war about this. Then they say, okay, your nephew can be the king, but you can never make an alliance with France. So Louis's like, okay, I guess that's so, all, whatever, you know. Because, uh, you know, he's French. And uh, so then now you have a bourbon on the throne of Spain. That's the Spanish bourbons. If you ever encounter that in the book, um, that's a fun thing. Um, he is an ugly boy. And now, um, Cyan asked about mercantilism, and mercantilism is like the official uh, thing of Louis the Fourteenth. It's an economic system per, uh, that was proposed to him by Jean Baptiste Colbert, and Jean Baptiste Colbert comes up with this system. He says, "Look, what if everything we do in this country is to make the king rich?" And the king's like, "I'm listening," and the uh, the other people are like, "Wait, what?" So the government gets a share of everything. The example I use very frequently is, remember when you studied like the Boston Tea Party and all of that in probably eighth grade and maybe even fifth grade, and they talked about how, hey, you got to have a, um, you got to have everything Dad, on British ships. When I get some, to plug your own. Okay. Um, the, uh, oh God, what was I talking about? I, I forget what I'm talking about in class. And then if I have a distraction, oh goodness. Somebody, what was I talking about? Um, the Seon something. The Seon. Sven, are you listening to me? No, I'm trying to figure out if the chocolate is a problem. It shouldn't be for that much. Baby. I was talking about Sesame Street. Perfect. Mercantilism. Perfect. Okay. So mercantilism is... Basically, everything's on the gold standard back then, right? So make sure the crown secures the most gold. Well, Boston Tea Party, the reason everybody was upset is because they had to buy from a certain government-owned company. That's mercantilism. Having everything go through the um, – everything go through the, uh, the nice folks over at the government means the government is going to make more money – you're not necessarily going to get the lowest prices. How was mercantilism used after Lewis? Expired? Mercantilism is very popular all over Europe. The problem is you say, okay, I want to trade more with other people than they trade. Uh, I, want, I want to trade more with other people, um, and I want it to be a favorable balance of trade. So in other words, I'm trading more okay. stuff out. I'm exporting okay? more, pe more stuff out. He is. He is. And um, I'm importing less. This is actually what Trump right now wants to do. 
uh, he wants to have a higher, uh, more favorable balance of trade where it favors the Americans. Um, Adam Smith comes along in the late 18th century, 1776, and he says, hey, um, guys, we don't need to do that. Trade's good for everybody. So the government shouldn't be involved at all. We should just all be trading. So basically mercantilism is very big for a long period of time. Yeah, you can bring Tigger around. So Tixie time! This is Lord Tigglesworth. I already introduced him. Okay, okay, that's all. So, um, so the th problem with mercantilism is if you're tr if you're trying not to, if you're trying not to trade as a, to uh, export as much stuff as you, or if you're trying to export a lot more than you import, other countries are like, yo, um, we don't want to play with you. Uh, you're just trying to take advantage of us. And mercantilism is very much like, yes, actually we are. But it encourages a secondary thing, which is having a colony. If you have a colony, you can force them to trade only with you, or at least most favorably with you. So you can make a lot more money. So this is the first wave of imperialism. It kind of dovetails with the age of exploration where the Spanish are setting up all kinds of stuff in the new world in order to trade. And um, do you need me to look it up? Can I you want me to pause this? Yes. Okay, guys. I got to pause real quick. How do I pause? I'm going to entertain them. For his size. Yes. So, um, back. Dog's okay. So, uh, what replaces mercantilism is capitalism, Adam Smith's system. Um, although, like, like I said, occasionally you'll have somebody like Trump who's like, oh, no, you know, well, let's not, let's have a favorable balance of trade. When it comes down to it, most economists nowadays are very cool with like, hey, as long as we're trading, we're good. It doesn't have to be exactly equal. We don't want to put tariffs on things, which is a thing mercantilism does, which says, hey, if um, if you're buying from me, great, if you're buying from me, great. But if I'm buying, uh, but if you try to sell to my people, I'll make it charge more. Basically, I'll put a tax on it. So tea that comes from your country costs more than my tea that I make here, that sort of thing. Uh, so it leads to, it, tariffs do actually suck. Uh, mercantilism, um, think 17th century, uh, so Louis the Fourteenth. Um, it's also going to be in every other country, so roughly 1600s to late 1700s. Um, it's replaced by capitalism. Um, mercantilism differs from capitalism because mercantilism is basically government makes all the money. Capitalism is you don't have the government involved at all. Uh, that's the idea, at least. Where the government completely stays out of it, laissez-faire. So you should be fine there. Uh, was it successful? Well, sure. It's successful in that it makes a lot of money for the crown, for the for the king. It's unsuccessful in that it doesn't create a lot of wealth all over the country, and it forces you to have to acquire colonies. Now that's fine for your Spain's. Uh, France gets involved. The New World. There's a hefty piece of France over there, but. Uh, later on in the 1700s, France is going to lose all their territory in the New World uh, as a result of losing a war against the British and their colonists, the Americans. And when they do that, they've lost some of their biggest colonies. They also lose uh, uh, India in that war, uh, most of their North American stuff. 
so they're like, well, crap, um, fine. Uh, we'll uh, we'll switch systems and eventually they'll switch over to capitalism. Oh, it's just a it's just a process of um, over time with the French Revolution. It's uh, a transition period, but it's not like it's a magic day where they just go like no more mercantilism. It's just a slow process because capitalism is where people own their own businesses. So essentially, by having them own their own businesses, uh, the government staying out of those businesses and then those businesses making tons of money. Uh, maybe they pay income tax to the government. So the government still gets a nice cut. And yet then you create a lot more wealth within your own country and more jobs. And it's really good in that way. So basically the success is what causes it uh, to move from mercantilism to capitalism because capitalistic countries like Britain, which employed that strategy early on in the industrial revolution are a lot more successful. Um, Britain has moved to capitalism pretty much by the early 1800s whereas everybody else is a little bit hanging on with the old mercantilistic system. Okay, let's leave that out of it, Pumpkin. Okay, capitalism, uh, yeah, privatization is similar. Um, privatization is, um, is essentially you know, privatizing things. Now, I think what you're talking about is the government making things Uh, with the government making things, and um, Sarah's question just threw me off a little bit. Explain the difference between capitalism, communism, and other. Other is not an economic system, so I cannot really say that I can explain that very easily. Um, capitalism and communism, I, I just finished explaining capitalism, but again, uh, people own their own businesses, and um, that is going to be what, what we have in America. Like, I could start a business if I wanted to. That's capitalism. The government like, like doesn't get a cut of it. I don't have to like go and officially have a government business that I work for in order to make money. I could have my own business and become successful. Communism is a period three thing. Uh, it doesn't show up until the mid 1800s because it's a reaction to the industrial revolution. Um, I, I don't know what you're thinking. Are you asking me what you're thinking? Um, the other one is socialism, it, which is, or again, a reaction to uh, capitalism. And you'll see that in period three. Uh, we'll talk about that next week. Um, so privatization, what I think you're thinking of with that, because I think you're thinking of the presentations we did in the Cold War in the 1970s and 80s, would be the government privatizing uh, different things, like having, for example, uh, hey, we're not going to be involved in your health care private people are going to be involved in that. In other words, businesses that are not run by the government will be in charge of that. So that's privatization. Um, other questions? Um, I think I covered all of that. Okay, so that's Louis the Fourteenth. Now, Louis the Fourteenth, lots of wars. Um, Louis the Fifteenth takes over. And he's trying to be a Louis the Fourteenth type, where he is in charge of everything, and he's like, you know, ah, you know, I, I'm going to pull the strings too. But people are not having it as much. Uh, you'll see a decline in royal power uh, because people straight up just sometimes don't do what he wants. Uh, sometimes it gets the court system involved, and this is the confusing thing I was trying to allude to earlier: is that uh, in France they have a thing called the Parliament. But it's the court system, and it's spelled as parliaments, parlaments, instead of parliaments. Like parliament was with an I, and the French have parlaments. Um, but for you, for this class, we don't really care too much about that. Essentially, just understand Louis the Fifteenth not as successful in implementing uh, absolutist strategy as Louis the Sixteenth. He try or Louis the Fourteenth. He tries. He's just less successful. He'll be even. Uh, he's more successful, though, than Louis XVI, who straight up gets called out and exposed. Exposed. And um, he will be called out and people will be like, no. And kind of that's where we should probably go next. Um, Louis XV, though, what do you need to know? Uh, he does a thing where, remember how France has always been at war with Austria, Hungary, not Austria, the Holy Roman Empire? Uh, Peace of Utrecht just ends the treaty 
of Spanish succession. So I already talked about it without calling it the Peace of Utrecht. So yes, you should know about it, 1713, but essentially says France is going to be, um, they're going to put their guy on the throne of uh, Spain. It's going to be Philip of Anjou, who's Louis the XIV's nephew, but they can never make a, uh, make, they can never unite. So it, it takes away that threat that Louis had. So yes, but not really too much. Don't worry about it too much. Um, so the French Revolution. The French Revolution is the one that a lot of people get lost on because it has three major phases. It actually has more, but we're going to talk about three major phases. We got the liberal phase. That's the beginning. We got the radical phase. That's when it gets all crazy. And then we got the Napoleonic phase. Now, some historians don't like to include Napoleon in the French Revolution at all. They would be like, um, actually, Napoleon is a dictator, uh, blah, blah, blah. For this class, I th believe I already made the case in my earlier lectures that I consider Napoleon to at least be a little bit Enlightenment focused, which was the focus of the French Revolution anyway, is to carry out the ideas of the Enlightenment. So when we talk about the liberal phase of the French Revolution, we've got to talk about philosophy. And essentially, Enlightenment, let's summarize it in one thing. The Enlightenment is all about progress and making things uh, more clear through understanding. They don't want superstition. They don't want ignorance. They want people to understand how stuff works. So that can be everything from astronomy. That can be people saying like, well, you know, we don't want superstition and ignorance. What's the best form of government? Let's debate it. So people are debating that kind of stuff. You got people talking about like, is it right for the government to execute people? Is it right to have religious intolerance? And an enlightenment guy is always going to be talking about, well, what's the most, you know, enlightened? What's the most reasonable way? Mm -hmm. Enlightenment equals reason. Okay, they're very big on reason. So, boys, come here. Otter. Nope, nope, no bark. Otter, otter, leave it. Come here. So, uh, who wants a cuddle? Who wants a cuddle? Leave it wants a cuddle for Get it off. Okay, you get your cuddle off. Brownie eater. Crazy boy. Don't eat a brownie. So, um, so that enlightenment equals reason, progress, and using science and getting rid of ignorance. Your big enlightenment guys are uh, like uh, Voltaire. He's the easiest example. He showed up on the practice test you guys took earlier this week. And um, he tried to lick me in the face. I saw that. Uh, and he is anti-superstition. He's pro um uh, you know, enlightened absolutism, which is the kings that try to use the enlightenment to guide their rule, uh, like Frederick the Great over in Prussia, uh, Maria Theresa and Joseph II in Austria, and um, I'm forgetting one. Who am I forgetting? <laughs> oh, forgetting? Who's the other absolutist? Did you ever talk about Louis? Louis the Fifteenth is not an absolutist. I'm, I'm not not an enlightened absolutist. Oh, I don't know who you don't want to talk. So, um, so uh, Voltaire is a big fan of those guys because they're like, let's get rid of the death penalty. Let's try to make our people's lives better uh, using government programs to do that instead of just enriching ourselves at the expense of the people. And so the the French Revolution starts up, and people are like, yo. Um, let's, uh, let's talk about that. I'll get to the English Civil War, uh, bro. Let me talk about the French Revolution first and then kind of backtrack over because to me it's peripheral. I know it comes first, but it's a way of kind of comparing your absolutism and its logical conclusion in the French Revolution um, with a different way of going over, over in England. Tell your brother to stop barking. Otter, come here. All right. So uh, because there's this emphasis on reason and because – Otter, are you a bad boy? Are you a bad boy or a good boy? Good boys don't bark while I'm live streaming. Okay, well, you're a bad boy, I guess. Leave me a good boy. 
So uh, because of this emphasis on individual, uh, you know, trying to make the lives of people better and using reason to do so, out of this comes this growth of this idea of rights, like certain rights that all humans have. And frankly, in an absolutist system, it ain't that way. Uh, the people have very few rights. So people start saying like, yo, um, what if we had more rights? And a lot of these people can be found in the third estate. Remember that was the everybody else group of the third of the three estates. And the bourgeoisie are the richest members of that third estate. Again, doctors, lawyers, other professionals. And the um, guys like Maximilian Robespierre start saying like, well, hey, you know what we should do is we should have um, more representation. So around that same time, they're experiencing a crisis financially in France. Louis XVI is the king at that point. He is married to the Austrian Marie Antoinette. And they essentially say, yo, um, we need money. But instead of just giving it to him, uh, the nobles say, no, you got to call the Estates General. And he's like, that hasn't been called since Henry IV. And everybody's like, yeah, that's a long time ago. It's like over 100 years. You need to get back to that. So he calls members of the first, second, and third estate. And the third estate is dominated by these Enlightenment-influenced uh, bourgeoisie members, including some very radical guys like the Jacobins. Uh, remember the Jacobins? Jacobins, my wife, my wife says. So uh, the Jacobins are guys like Maximilien Robespierre. He's the easiest example. They want rights and they want them now. They want a constitutional monarchy like we're going to see is uh, going to happen over in England. And um, the king doesn't want to give it to them. So uh, they say, well, fine, we're going to break up and we're not going to pass you tax reform where we raise taxes on people until you agree to give us a new constitution. And the king is like, what? No. And he locks them out of their meeting place. So they all go down to this tennis court. It's an indoor tennis court. And they say, we are all pledging here. We are not going to stop. We're not going to break up until we are given a constitution. Meanwhile, people in Paris are freaking out because they liked what was happening there. They were like, oh, cool. We're starving to death. Bread prices are extremely high. And there's people we here are trying to change things with the king and get us more rights. And the king is not responding to that. And then a rumor starts in Paris that the king is going to send in troops and he's going to bust up some of this dissent within the city with armed guards. So people are like, nah, oh, heck to the nah. So they attack the, this fortress I literally just talked about the tennis court oath. Maybe you got here late. Tennis court oath, basically, they say they're not going to break up until they get a new constitution. Okay? Uh, it's members of the third estate joined by uh, poorer members of the second estate and first estate, uh, dominated by uh, radical elements uh, that were influenced by the Enlightenment within the third estate. So... Uh, the people go to the, this this fortress that used to be in the Middle Ages a symbol of the king's power. At this point, by the 1700s, it's still a symbol, a symbol of the king's power, but it's not so notorious anymore. Like, they don't use it to arrest, like, every political prisoner and hold them and torture them anymore. They only have, like, five prisoners in there by 1789, one of whom is a guy who's schizophrenic and believes he's the reincarnation of Jesus. That's trivia, but it's weird and I remember it. So uh, the people storm the Bastille, uh, they attack it, they dismantle it brick by brick. Brick by brick, what you gonna do, huh? And um, the guards, you say, what about the guards? Why didn't the guards shoot them? Well, you gotta reload those old timey guns. So the guards are like, bam, reload, re oh, you just cut my head off while I was reloading. That's my bad, I really should have thought that one through. So um, the people manage to 
Oh, when was the tennis court? Oh, 1789. Um, well, June 14th is the storming of the Bastille. Is it June or July? June. It's Bastille's birthday. Okay, is it June or July? Yeah, it's not June 20th. Bastille Day is not June 28th, Goose. I'm pretty sure it is. How can you look it up? Um, so um, it must have been before that, but shortly before. So it would have been late June, early July, I guess, uh, Tennis Court Oath, 1789. So uh, the people storm the Bastille. The king pays attention. He's like, oh. oh Bastille Day, July 14th. July 14th. Like I said, July 14th. Listen. So. Something's on June 28th, that's just what it is. Oh, that was, that was the, the assassination of Archduke. Oh, yeah, June 20th, 1914, it's the assassination of Archduke Francis Ferdinand. So, um, so after that, the king starts kind of taking him seriously because people cut off the guards' heads and, like, prayed them around on sticks. They literally dismantled the entire, uh, the entire prison, the Bastille, and also, there was a secondary reason they went there. Not just it was a symbol of the king's power. They want gunpowder. And that place was loaded with gunpowder. Uh, so they got in there, and they got gunpowder so that if the king came, they could battle and defend themselves. So, um, yeah, th so these actions lead to the Declaration of the Rights of Men, which is not a constitution say but it's a step in the right direction it's essentially a statement of enlightenment principles also 1789 um probably july or august and um it says essentially hey all human beings have certain rights and uh the government should respect those rights um it does things like say hey no longer are we going to have social classes in france everybody will be equal Stuff that we in America take for granted because it was guaranteed by our constitution earlier. But keep in mind, the French helped us, the Americans. I just pointed to my, oh. The French helped us, America. I always keep an American flag near me at all times, just in case I need to talk about freedom. And they, um, they basically say like, yo, we're gonna help these guys fight their revolution. The Americans succeed. The Americans get all this freedom. And then the French soldiers go back to France, and it's like, oh, well, that sucks. We're still not free. We don't have a constitution guaranteeing rights and stuff. Well, bummer. And that's one of the things that leads to this Declaration of Rights of Man. So, yeah. Any other questions about that? Um, then uh, next thing is that the National Assembly is formed. Um, that is now the new compromise. It's a legislative branch. Uh, they still call it the National Assembly today in France. It's kind of like their parliament. They make the laws. And this new uh, group immediately starts trying to get stuff done. Well, the king makes an error because they want to make a new constitution with him at the head. And some days he's like, this sounds like a wonderful idea. I'm fine with this. Meanwhile, he's secretly corresponding with people outside of the country uh, and trying to encourage them to come in and help him out militarily. Finally, he tries to escape. And once he tries to escape and gets caught, he gets dragged back to Paris and people are like, you just tried to commit treason against your own government. You were gonna be the head of the government, bro. He's like, but I am the king. I shouldn't have to share my power. I'm an ancestor. Louis the 14th was one of my ancestors. And um, people are like, yeah, no, we're going to put you on trial. So they put him on trial. Now, remember the Jacobins, Jake, what was it? Jacobins, like Robespierre. They say, look, if the king is still here, our revolution must be wrong because we need to go full republic. And republics don't have kings. We need to go America style. And the king's like, um, wait. <laughs> and uh, the dog is making cute noises. And so uh, the king is all like, um, no, no, thank you. And uh, people are like, well, um, 
what are we gonna do now? And the king is put on trial. They make a vote. Do we sentence him to just exile? Do we kick him out or something? Well, if we do that, what if he tries to come back in and become king again? What if he brings Austrian armies? Remember, Austria was a pretty bad astronaut fighting force back then. And his wife, Marie Antoinette, was Austrian. So they're definitely down to clown with that. So they say, no, we let him go. He's going to cause trouble. We need to kill this fool. So they sentence the king to death, have him executed, and they use a new revolutionary technique. I'm sure everybody remembers the name of the new death penalty method they use. Uh, the idea is that it cuts off your head very quickly, efficiently, and everyone is equal in death. No longer are there separate punishments for nobles and for peasants. Uh, everybody gets the same. Do you remember what it's called? I know it's a little bit difficult to spell because it's a French word. It's named after the creator uh, who actually is named the same thing, Dr. Joseph I don't know if nobody's responding. Yeah, guillotine. Yeah. Good job, bro. Um, good job, Lindsay. Uh, is uh, Bro got it, though. Bro got it on the first try. But you got it, too, Lindsay. LD, you did a good job. So, um, so they use the guillotine. They chop off the king's head. Everybody rushes the guillotine uh, because there's a belief amongst the peasantry that the king's blood is magic and has healing powers. Uh, this isn't going to be on the test. It's just weird and interesting. And so... Um, the king is dead. They hold his head up. Look, he's dead. Um, shortly thereafter, they have the queen executed. Um, the king had a son, but he's so mistreated in captivity that he ends up dying of neglect, which is always kind of vague, but you can assume that there was uh, abuse being perpetrated upon him. And now that you've got no king, they got to worry about other countries. They already had problems with Austria and Prussia. Austria and Prussia had already declared war on them. Now that the king's dead, England jumps in there as well, and everybody's like, you guys are crazy. You just murdered your king. Keep in mind, all of these are places run by kings, and they're all like, yeah, we can't let this happen. And so they enter a new phase. Everything so far was the liberal phase. That's the one where they were focused on yes thing uh, everything up to now was focused on like hey we are trying to live by the principles of the enlightenment we are trying to establish a constitutional monarchy once you get rid of that once you get rid of the king by bloodshed we enter into radical phase where the crazies are running the whole thing and um that is the jacobins jacobins um robespierre uh becomes the head of a 12 person committee uh, who decides that their problem is not that the revolution is going a bad direction. The problem is that people aren't loyal enough to the revolution and that's going to create problems. So he institutes all kinds of anti enlightenment things, such as a secret police. Uh, he listened to people and sentenced them for ridiculous crimes, um, including, like, you know, if you steal a loaf of bread that can get you executed or sent to jail. Um, but I thought this was about the Enlightenment. Again, we've entered a new phase now where it's like, we got to keep this revolution alive by any means necessary, um, by any cost, whatever it takes. And um, this leads to uh, Robespierre instituting the Reign of Terror, where they try to eliminate any and all enemies and uh, people are scared to say anything like one woman her husband was killed and uh, then they force her uh, because she complains about her husband being killed because he said something nice about the king they force her to be underneath him as his body his headless body drips blood onto her and uh, onto her head and then they guillotine her shortly thereafter I mean that's just murderous and evil but that's still technically the French Revolution. And uh, Robespierre says, you know what, revolution, or actually Danton, another revolutionary, says revolutions are not made with rose water. You got to kill some people sometimes. And sure enough, they start killing people like crazy. And um, the war is going poorly at first against everybody else. 
but ultimately they managed to turn the tide through using uh, new techniques of just using tons of people to overwhelm the army. Um, keep in mind, they lost a lot of their best generals and whatnot, because a lot of those guys were noble. So uh, by getting rid of them, they're, that's why they has a lot of early defeats. They have to really kind of look for talent in other places. Now, there's this little fella, he's not actually little, everybody thinks he's short, but he's not, named Napoleon, who shows up and he's got a lot of talent. He's this little Corsican dude. And uh, they're like, hey, this is a good time for good leaders. So they get um, Napoleon into a position of power. Um, he eventually becomes their major general. He is fighting the wars against these other people. He's beaten these people. And eventually, whilst this is all going on, People are like, yeah, we're killing too many people. Robespierre, you're too crazy. And so they decide what we need to do is we need to get rid of Robespierre. Um, so ultimately they turn on him. They execute him. They call this the Thermidorian reaction because one of the weirder things about the French Revolution is they try to invent a whole new society, including renaming the months of the year renumbering how many days are in a week and um, abolishing Christianity. So by getting uh, Robespierre dead, they can kind of start moving to normalcy again because it was wild stuff, guys. Uh, so Napoleon takes over uh, because essentially people are like, hey, um, what are we going to do here? We need to have uh, some stability. And one of the original guys who had written What is the Third Estate, this very influential pamphlet that talked about how the Third Estate was the lifeblood of France and uh, the first two estates, the clergy and the nobility, were like parasites. He, his, his name's um, Emmanuel Says, the Abbey uh, Emmanuel Says, uh, invites Napoleon, he and a group of others, invite Napoleon to leave his army, come back to Paris, and take over, a stage a coup, an uh, armed takeover of the government. And that's exactly what Napoleon does. Napoleon rules as a dictator, eventually declaring himself emperor. And he carries out some of the things of the Enlightenment. Now, somebody asked before about the Napoleonic code. Yeah, Napoleonic, um, Napoleonic era is after Robespierre. It's the same people they were fighting. But oftentimes when people talk about Napoleonic wars, they mean once Napoleon's in charge. Because once he's in charge... He's a military mastermind. He starts whooping everybody. He conquers all of Europe, essentially. Uh, the people he doesn't conquer, he forces into treaties that are favorable to him. And essentially, uh, he is just a bad astronaut. The problem is, he's a better general than he is a ruler. He claims to love the Enlightenment, but he makes this Napoleonic Code. And the Napoleonic Code does some things that are very pro-Enlightenment, like it guarantees equality under the law for all citizens, but it also strips women of all rights. It's very traditional and sexist in that way. And so he is um, not very enlightenment in that sense. Um, enlightenment would also be use reason to dictate your policies, make your people's uh, lives better. He, he beats everybody except for England and then he says, well, fine, uh, nobody's allowed to trade with England anymore. We'll have this new thing called the Continental System. That's not very enlightened. It's bad trading. Um, technically, the idea of capitalism, which we spoke of earlier, is, high, is uh, made by Adam Smith in 1776. And it's an enlightenment idea because it's going to enrich the people and make their lives better. So... Um, so by not following that, some people are like, you're not very enlightened. He continues having a secret police, which again, not very enlightened. Something Robespierre had done, and nobody's arguing that Robespierre was a great idea of enlightenment. Robespierre claimed to be, but he didn't do a very good job. Um, so Napoleon is problematic in that sense, but very military, militarily successful. Uh, he ends up... Uh, conquering most of Europe, as I said, but the continental system makes the Russians mad. Uh, the Russian czar at that time, uh, Alexander I, says, yo, guys, um, this Napoleonic 
uh, idea of the continental system. It sucks. It's terrible. Napoleon's like, you say what, mate? And he decides, I'm going to go over and invade Russia and teach him a little lesson. But as we all know, you don't invade Russia, especially in the winter. Napoleon loses the war. And as he is fleeing, defeated, uh, he is attacked by all of his former allies that he had beaten into submission. So Prussia and Austria, uh, they all go to war with him as well. He's defeated. They kick him off the throne. No longer do you get to be emperor, Napoleon. And they exile him to this little island called Elba. Uh, he escapes, comes back for 100 days, renews the war, not because he wants to. He actually says, I want peace. But everybody else, like England, Austria, Prussia, and Russia are all like, um, no. He goes to war and loses in 1815 at the Battle of Waterloo. If you're looking for the Napoleonic period only, 1799 to 1815 is the Napoleonic period. 1799 is when he takes over, declares himself emperor a few years later, establishes the Napoleonic Code a few years after that. He restores Catholicism as the state religion of France, and then he, um, then he dips uh, after they defeat him. Uh, they replace him. The continental system was just basically saying, like, everybody on the continent of Europe, you're not allowed to trade with England anymore. And it, they thought it would destroy the English economy, but it didn't because England had colonies everywhere. Remember the French colonies? They stole them. And um, then they, uh, they were still on good terms with us in America even after we had kicked them out because we understood we needed them to be economically successful and they needed us. So even after we are you know, independent of them, we in America still managed to, um, we still managed to have a good relationship. France thought that that's, this would cripple them though. And so when it doesn't, and actually it's bad for the people of Europe because they're not able to trade with England and get cheap goods because England had started this new thing called the industrial revolution. And uh, they were beginning to produce cheap textiles, which would be cloth made stuff. Um, all over, and they were like, yo, you know, you don't want our cheap stuff? Well, okay, fine, we'll wait till Napoleon's gone, or you stop doing this system, and whatevs. So, what's that? Hello, son! You gonna say hi? Hi. Well, they can't see you. Yeah. you oh, all right. My son is a hashtag teen, so he doesn't want to be on the hashtag video. <coughs> I'm sorry, baby. Don't be scared. Yeah. yeah, I got Lieben here. We're cold. All right, so that's the French Revolution and Napoleon, at least with like the most essential stuff. Obviously, there's more detail, but that's the most essential stuff. Uh, does anybody have any questions about the French Revolution, Napoleon, anything I didn't go into detail? That's I'm kind of painting with broad strokes because, frankly, um, if you don't know that stuff, talking to you about the intricacies of – the Napoleonic code and stuff is probably lost. Uh, we're just trying to review big, uh, big notes here right now. So, any questions? Hashtag Teen Prop. You're right. He's decided he's going to go play uh, on the Switch. What are you playing, boy? He's waiting for your tape and over and over. Oh, I'll go I'll, uh, when I'm done in about half an hour. You said five. Your thing says five. Oh, is it five? Oh, I started later too, big. I started later, about half an hour. Oh, he wants to go over to his, his uh, cousin's house. Have a huge headache. I will take you in about half an hour, boy. So, um, what time do they need you let's move over yeah, to England. Yeah, text him and tell him you'll be there at 5.30. Is he alone? No, not yet. Text him and tell him you'll be there at 5.30. 5.30 is okay. No, tell him I'll be there at 5.30. So, uh, English Civil War. Let's let's uh, go over to England. Um, England, essentially, you have a pretty sweet thing going on with Elizabeth I. A lot of people call this the Elizabethan Renaissance. She made life better for people. She decisively de defeated the Spanish in uh, 1588 at the Spanish Armada. That plus the Spanish policy of over importing Jason, precious precious metals. All right. Uh, leads to all kinds of problems uh, with the Spanish economy and leads to the Spanish downfall. After the 1500s, it's just like circling the drain for the Spanish. 
Meanwhile, the English are on the upswing. But Elizabeth, as you might recall, was married to her country. She never took a, uh, I must have mate. Uh, she never took a husband and therefore never was able to produce a little little baby tutor. I'm not a weirdo. That's the way, that's what she said. A baby tutor. That's the way she used to talk about it. So it, the throne went to her cousins, who are the Stuarts. Now, which Stuarts do you need to worry about? Um, they take power in 1603, and they go till 1688. There are four of them. There is James, Charles, both James I, Charles I. They're interrupted by the English Civil War. More on that in a second. And then it goes in reverse order, Charles and James. You don't need to fret about them too much. Honestly, the Stuarts, let's paint in broad strokes here. They are from Scotland. So they're considered kind of backwards by many of the people in England because that was a bias they held back then. Uh, they are, um, whoa, you want down? Oh, mama, mama. You go get mama. I love you. So uh, the um, the Stuarts think of them as being they're Protestants. They're still Church of England, but they are very sympathetic to the Catholics. Uh, even though they are Protestant, they are not as mean to the Catholics as the English would like. In fact, there's a sect that develops called the Puritans who want to purify the English church, the English uh, church of these Catholic influences that they feel like the Stuarts aren't doing a very good job of getting rid of. So uh, James the first, he's famous because he is your guy that is, um, uh, that makes the King James Bible. Under him, they authorize an English version of the Bible it's a Bible probably if you are religious or you've even heard of religion, you've probably heard of the King James Bible. He dies, his son takes over. Charles I wants to be a Louis XIV type. He wants to rule um, without Parliament. If you pick that up with one thing, the cat will be fine, but the bag will not. You need to get the cat out of the bag first. Um, my son just tried to pick up a, a bag by one handle with the cat. So he put it down, so of course the cat got in. You monster. That's the cat's bag. Anyway, um, so Charles I tries to rule without Parliament. Um, the Parliament doesn't like this, obviously. They had been really involved in things under Elizabeth. Uh, they'd been, you know, kept as, you know, in the loop. Charles wants to rule without them. Eventually, there's a war. It is the... Um, King and his forces versus the Parliament and their forces. The Parliament's army is called the Roundheads because they had round helmets. Seriously, that's it. It's stupid. The King's forces. No, that's the. This is the English Civil War. Uh, the um, King's forces are known as the Royalists, sometimes called the Cavaliers. I've seen it called both. Uh, I prefer the name Cavaliers because I think it sounds cool. But Royalists versus Roundheads should suffice. Um, after the royalists lose, after the king loses, the parliamentary army, which is led by a fella named Oliver Cromwell, who is a Puritan, that is set up and they say, listen, um, what if we didn't break up and what if we, what if I just started being ruler and establish a dictatorship? Of course, he doesn't call it a dictatorship. He says, it's a protectorate. I need to protect the people of England using my army. Can we vote for you? No. No, you can't vote for us. I'm in charge now. Also, I'm a Puritan. So all of my crazy Puritan beliefs are now law. So he outlaws, uh, you know, movie. Well, they didn't have movies. Outlaws plays. He would have outlawed movies if they had them. Um, he outlaws uh, plays. He outlaws concerts. He said he to go. I'm working bigger than my headache, and you're still not ready to go. How are you? I told him wait till five thirty. Um, they, uh, they, it's extremely. He outlaws Christmas for gosh sakes. It's extremely unpopular. 
Um, but he's got the army, so what are you going to do about it? He eventually dies. His son tries to rule for a couple of years, but the people are like, no. Um, they get rid of, uh, well, Oliver's already dead. He, he died. And they get rid of his son um, and uh, take out Oliver Cromwell's body, drag it through the streets, and then hang it, which is kind of unnecessary, frankly, because he was dead. But they're making a statement. I respect that. Uh, now we go, well, who's going to be king now? So, Charles II. If you just remember, like, little bits about these guys, like, James the First. What? I, I love you. I'm glad to hear about War Dog, but hit me with, say, Survivor spoilers just before you say it. And um, you have a nice evening. Um, James Bible wants to be an absolutist. Charles wants to be an absolutist, goes to war with Parliament, loses, gets his head chopped off. Grab the mill. Oliver Cromwell uh, rules Puritan dictator, unpopular, crazy Puritan. After he's gone, Charles II, who was the son of Charles I. It's a very good name. It means manly, actually. And Charles II is sometimes called the Merry Monarch. Uh, he is the, um, the one that restores all of the relaxation, the, you know, the parties, the dancing, all of that, which had been made illegal by Oliver Cromwell. And um, they're like, ah, oh, thank goodness we got the king back. But Parliament still doesn't really work with him very well. He tries to make a secret deal with Louis XIV. He gets caught, and then he displays some really weird good timing by dying before he gets in trouble. So he's then replaced by James II. Now, James II, so Charles II, Restoration, fun, um, he's king again, dies. James II, openly Catholic. That's not okay. We've gone from being sympathetic to the Catholics to being openly Catholic. Not cool. So the English are like, oh my God, what are we going to do? And you might pause for a second and be like, wait, what about like religious tolerance and stuff? Not a thing. This was the 1600s. We went back in time a little bit because I wanted to compare and contrast. Um, the Enlightenment hasn't hit yet. There are some people writing about natural rights and stuff and what rights human beings actually have, but they're quite cynical in general towards the people. Um, guys like Thomas Hobbes say that the people really have no true right to do anything. They should just shut up and obey the king. Um, so yeah. Uh, James II, though, he's openly Catholic. And people are like, wait, well, but we have the Church of England. We haven't been Catholic for a long time, not since Mary Tudor, nicknamed Bloody Mary because she was killing Protestants. OMG, are we going to die? So they hatch a plot. They say, okay, we got to get rid of this king because his wife just popped. She, just, she, was, she had a baby in her belly, and she just popped that baby out, and it was a boy. So now we got a real threat of having a Catholic dynasty where the king will die. He was a Catholic. His son will be Catholic. His son will be Catholic. England might be re-Catholicized. Bad, at least from the English perspective. So they hatch a plan. They get James's daughter, who has gone off and married a Dutch prince named William uh, of Orange, William III of the Netherlands. And they say, yo, Willie, big Willie Styles, you want to come over and uh, be king? And Mary can be the queen. And technically, it's okay because she's related to the Stuarts, so it works. And the people who did this are the parliament. This demonstrates. Now, here's the kind of question you might encounter on the AP test. The English method is we're going to have more parliamentary involvement they end up actually displacing their king, not by execution. You could say they did after the English Civil War. But with the thing in 1688 called the Glorious Revolution, they get rid of James II without a fight. He runs off to France to go live there. So they have a peaceful transfer of power, whereas the uh, French have a very violent transfer of power. The English transfer of power still around today. You still have a constitutional monarchy because that's what comes out of this. In 1689, they passed the English Bill of Rights. And the English Bill of Rights uh, puts into things all the things that we th take for granted nowadays. 
that um, like as Americans that uh, all people are equal uh, that um, that people have certain rights and the king should have to listen to the people uh, that sort of thing so yeah oof, oof. okay so that's um, that's in England that's contrasted with uh, France. Now, obviously, the Enlightenment affects the English. They read about it and stuff. But your primary big Enlightenment authors tend to be French. Uh, for gosh sakes, they're called the philosophes, the philosophers from France. Um, whereas the English philosophers, I mean, I'm sure there's some, but they're not the famous ones. Uh, because England already had a constitutional monarchy. They didn't have to agitate for change in the same way. So because of that, it leads to a totally different path. And the English will then, throughout the 1700s and the 1800s, have a king that's accountable to the parliament. They never go towards absolutism. They flirted with it, with James and Charles. They tried to get it. Guys, what if we didn't bark? What if we didn't bark? All right, does anybody have any questions? I, I think so. I saw like six people left, so I'm going to go put the dogs out. Who let the dogs out me? <laughs> Ask questions if you got questions. You guys want to go outside? Again? <laughs> yes. <laughs> go get it. <laughs> go kill. I always wonder if my neighbors still hear me when I let the dogs out and I say something like, go kill. Um, but yeah. Looks like nobody's done anything in the chat since 507. Sad. I should have had my daughter come here to uh, to yell at you. Um, uh, questions I missed. Um, ben, uh, Benjamin Rigby, he said, what political ideology were the Jacobins? I'm not sure. Uh, they were definitely not uh, conservative. They were quite liberal. Um, they were radical. Anytime you say radical, unless it's followed by radical conservatives, which would be very far right, uh, the Jacobins would be very far left. Um, they stop short of what later will be known as socialism. Uh, they don't want full equality for women and all that. Uh, they want to adhere to the principles of the Enlightenment, which is in itself a very liberal movement. Um, the Haskalah is the Jewish Enlightenment. I'm going to be very honest. If anybody ever asked you about the Haskalah, um, I would be shocked. But it's... Um, Moses Mendelssohn is probably the most famous, uh, the most famous uh, thinker out of that. Uh, he is a Prussian um, under the reign of Frederick the Great. So, oh, thank you, LD. Any other questions? I was going to wrap it up because guess what? It's taco night. My dumb son went over to uh, go play, I don't know, Fortnite or whatever with his cousin. But we're going to have tacos here. You go where the tacos are, right? Dum dum. So, anybody got any questions? I'll hang out for another minute or two. But if nobody got any questions, I'm gonna dip. I'm gonna go. Uh, you guys should go see Infinity uh, in game. In game, not Infinity War. Um, in game is real good. You go see it this weekend. Um, people will start spoiling it for you on the internet. People are awful. People are terrible. Um, I, I, if you are watching this, do not. Uh, no, you can't have any tacos. There are tacos. I would share if you were here, but fr quite frankly, Brandon, it'd be weird if I put a public invitation to come over to my house and have tacos on a Friday night with a student. Uh, you guys have a good weekend, too. Um, we're going to have more um, more reviews next week. I'm thinking we'll probably do them um, at 3 or 3.30, and I'll probably just do them from school, quite frankly, so that way my um, my dogs don't bark and stuff like that. Um, it is fun probably to, to watch me get distracted by my dogs. And I definitely like people sit here and, you know, see my kids and my wife and my, my puppers, my kittens. But, um, yeah, we'll probably do it next week about three 30 and, um, that will be the next one. It's going to be, I believe it's on Tuesday. Let me double check that. Yeah. Tuesday after school. Um, let's go ahead and just, I'm going to make it three 30. I'll, I'll send out a remind on Tuesday morning, but yeah, 3.30. Um, and that one will be on period three. 
So the questions you might want to, you might get would be stuff about socialism, uh, the French utopian socialists. Um, the 19th century gets complicated because there's a lot of stuff. So if you have any questions, uh, let me know about that. Okie dokie. You guys have a nice, I'm looking at my phone because on my phone I have the live chat um, going down. In case you're wondering what I keep staring at, my dog's gone, so I'm just staring at that. Okie dokie. Uh, you guys have a wonderful weekend. Go see Endgame before someone spoils that Lightning McQueen is in it. Oh, no.